Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Welcome to the first webinar of the third series of EPOS webinars. I am Hakan Ömerol from Ankara, Turkey, and I am the vice president of EPOS. Uh, I'm going to moderate the, this webinar entitled Current Standards in DDH Screening with my dear friend and colleague Renata Pospisil from Vienna, Austria. She is one of the immediate past councillors of the EPOS Executive Committee. Now we have a very interesting topics and a distinguished faculty in this webinar. First, Renata is going to talk about the current standards, techniques and protocols in the graph method. Then Maurizio De Pellegrin from Milan, Italy is going to talk about the best timing for newborn hip screening. This talk will be followed by two interesting talks about the management of graph, graph type 2A hips by Blazesz Prozinski from Lodz, Poland. He is the young councillor of the EPOS Executive Committee and Bettina Vesto from Düsseldorf, Germany. And I'm going to talk about the nationwide newborn hip screening experience in Turkey. And finally, Renata is going to answer the question which type of a newborn hip screening is the best. We are going to have enough time for discussion and you may ask your questions to the panelists by using the question function found in the control panel. We thank all the faculty for kindly accepting to attend this webinar and to share their valuable knowledge with all of us. We also thank all the attendees who has registered to this EPOS educational activity and the EPOS central office staff, especially San Hilton, who has made this live educational activity possible. Last but not least, we thank Orthopediatrics for kindly and seriously supporting this educational activity of EPOS. Now it's time for me to give the microphone and screen to Renato to make his talk. Dear colleagues, for me also a warm welcome uh, to our DDH screening webinars. And I would like to start with a short repetition of Graf's hip sonography so that we all know what we are talking about the next hour. The problems of visualizing anosified parts in a newborn hip and at the same moment to show movements of the femoral head was solved by the development of hip sonography. And I must admit that this slide is a little bit overcrowded, but I would like to focus on the fact that despite uh, the, the fact that Graf introduced hypsonography in the late 70s and started to do hypsonograms uh, in the 80s, the technique was finalized in the early 90s with uh, all its recommendations to uh, the treatment, to the evaluation of 2A immature hips and so on. And since then, the state of the art is to learn hip sonography according to graph by an instructional course as a standard and not to teach it by bedside teaching. Uh, you need to know that there are main pillars of graphs hip sonography starting with the correct scanning technique using a cradle and a probe guiding system and then once you have frozen your ultrasound image, you should start going through the so-called checklist number one, which is a correct identification of eight anatomical points or markers in your hip sonography. The first one is the identification of the chondroosseous junction. The second one is the femoral head with its visible or not visible ossific nucleus. The third one is the synovial fold ending into the joint capsule. And the next and fifth and very important anatomical marker in the hip sonogram is the so-called labrum, a hyaline uh, structure which is uh, triangular shown with an echo within the hip joint and its base ending on the cartilage roof of the baby hip joint which lies just above the femoral head and below the bony roof of the baby hip joint. At the end you should identify the bony rim 
which is the most lateral point of the concavity of the bony socket or the turning point from concavity to convexity. You are obliged to identify the bony rib for the further than description or measurement of the baby hip sonogram. Once you have correctly identified those eight anatomical structures, you're allowed to go on to checklist number two, which is checking the landmarks. You may follow this checklist in order to be able to identify the standard plane in which you should freeze your hip sonogram while you're doing the examination. And uh, for identifying the correct standard plane, which is in the mid portion of the baby hip, you need to be able to identify three coordinates or landmarks, which are first, the lower limb of the bony ilium, secondly, the midsection of the bony roof, which is an echo just parallel to your left or right border of your ultrasound image scan, and at the end, the labrum. In order to be able uh, to, to, to see what problems can arise with the uh, turned uh, probe and with, the, with not being in the correct standard plane, uh, you should look at the three ultrasound images here on my slide. If you turn the probe as seen in number one too much anteriorly, your echo of the os ilium will narrow the left border of your ultrasound image and you might have a false positive diagnosis. Your hip might look too bad. If you turn your probe too posteriorly and then identifying the, the good coverage of the baby hip, you might have a posterior scan with the echo of the os ilium uh, looking like a nose and maybe having a false negative diagnosis. That's why it's very important for you always to be in the middle part of the baby hip joint and to be able to say, okay, that's my standard plane. After checking checklist number one and checklist number two, follow the description. The description helps you to limit false diagnosis through measurement only, and you should start to describe the bony roof, which could be good, deficient, or poor. Type 1 hips, normal hips, always have a good bony roof. Type 2 hips, either physiological, immature or deficient, might, may have a deficient bony roof. And poor bony roofs have type 3 and type 4 dislocated hips. Then go on with the description of the bony rim area, which could be angular or blunt, rounded, and flattened. Type 1 hips, normal hips, always have an angular or a blunt bony rim area. Type 2 hips always have rounded bony rim areas and decentered, dislocated. Type 3 or type 4 hips always have flattened bony rim areas. At the end, you should be able to describe the cartilaginous roof, which can cover the femoral head or can be pressed upwards or downwards. In type 1 normal hips, the cartilaginous roof is always lying above the femoral head and covering the femoral head. In type 2 hips, the cartilaginous roof is still covering the femoral head. And in decentered, dislocated hips, the cartilaginous roof is pressed upwards, like in type 3 hips, or pressed downwards, like in type four hips. At the end, when finishing the anatomical description, you're allowed to do the measurements. With the measurements, you can be able to measure the so-called alpha angle, which is included by the baseline and the bony roof line. You need the alpha angle to be able to differentiate between the different types of graphs, hips. And the next angle you should measure is the beta angle, which is included by the baseline again, and the cartilage roof line. The beta angle differentiates between 1A or 1B hips and 2C, stable or unstable, and D hips. If you, at that moment, you don't know by heart the 
different angles and different types, you can classify the baby hip using the sonometer where you can easily find uh, the angles and the types behind these angles. So in conclusion, a graph's technique should only be instructed by standardized, course, standardized courses instead of bedside teaching, by teaching to do checklists each after each other in order to minimize errors and false diagnosis. Thank you. Good afternoon to all. Let me start Let me start with this paper from Susan Mahan published 2009 about the question to screen or not to screen and she concluded that the best strategy is a selective ultrasound screening. 6 years later and the paper titled, What has changed in the last 20 years? The um, author say, early diagnosis and treatment is critical to provide the best possible functional outcome. We perform a literal review of the last three years, putting the keywords DDH and early diagnosis, DDH and ultrasound, DDH and treatment. I want to talk uh, in this presentation only about early diagnosis. We collected 14 papers. I want to show you briefly some um, summary. So um, from Australia, they performed a selective ultrasound screening and they concluded that they have a high rates of late diagnosis. And from China, they concluded that early diagnosis or early treatment might be the key point in the DDH treatment. treatment. And from UK, they performed a GP check at six, eight weeks, and they found that four out of five children with DDH were not identified by clinical check. And from Sweden, they um, lowered the age performing um, clinical screening at six weeks, six months, and 10 months. They lowered the age after diagnosing a half of all children, but another half had still late presenting hip dislocation. And very interesting paper from the States, uh, they say there is a need for ultrasound enhanced examination training for the diagnosis to improve the early diagnosis of DDH for orthopedic surgeons and pediatric resi residents too. And this is also very interesting from the States, also expert examiners miss a significant number of frankly dislocated HEP. It may explain the persistent weight of late presenting DDH. Let me summarize the literal to a review of the last three years. The rate of late diagnosis increasing performance selective ultrasound screening, risk factor for failure our older age, the effectiveness of clinical examination is very low, and there is a need of ultrasound enhanced examination training. And what about early diagnosis in PubMed? We um, performed this literature review of 10 years, and the median age of 19 articles about a topic was three months. If we put the keywords risk factor, it decreases to six weeks. And another interesting uh, paper from the state, um, the majority of patients cited by this uh, author with symptomatic osteoarthritis of the hip did not match selective ultrasound screening guidelines. So um, to answer to this question, we've performed a study to look at the development of the um, acetabulum. We could collect 93 uh, type 3 Hips, according to graph, that means a severe dysplasia with a dislocation of the femoral head. And we perform an ultrasound diagnosis and treatment start, and a second follow up, and a third follow up. And so the first result of the anchor end values was that 
of course, uh, at the second follow-up, the third ultrasound, we have an improvement of the alpha angle value. But if we divide the, group, the patient in three groups, the group one with diagnosis and treatment below 11 days, and group two between 11 and 42 days, and group three more than 42 days of life, we have different results. And you can see in the group one, we um, the alpha angle achieved the normal value of the control group. And in group three, not at all, with a significant, um, statistically significant uh, uh, p-value. Uh, again, compare, compare the comparison between the three groups, we have no significant um, uh, result uh, um, in the comparison be between group one and the control group. That means we have normal HEPs. And again, the alpha angle gain at the time of the diagnosis is cle clearly represented by this diagram in which the best uh, result, the best alpha angle gain we have in the first week of life. And in, in other words, we could um, achieve mature HEPs in almost 90% of the HEPs in the group one and only 50% in group three. And another statement is that longer treatment does not mean better results. After three months, there is few further improvement. As you can see, um, these mathematical derived curve in the first six weeks, we have a fast development of the table. In the second or the, in the following weeks, we have a slow maturation of the acetabulum. And this study, in my opinion, a very important study, shows a strong dependency between alpha angle gain and the time of diagnosis, the younger the faster. And the mathematically derived maturation curve exponential in the first six weeks of life, fast maturation in the first six of life is very important. No significant correlation between alpha angle gain and length of treatment. So to answer the question, best timing for hepsonography in newborns as soon as possible before six weeks of life. And there's also an interdisciplinary consensus and an inter-society consensus published uh, with those statements. And I want to um, stimulate the most interested colleagues to join us in the ICOT Society. We have some meetings. This is a society about the DDH evaluation. We published recently a book about early diastomography diagnosis from the diagnosis to the ineffective treatment. And I think a pediatric orthopedic surgeon should have a US front use around the neck as the anesthesiologist has a stethoscope. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to, to be here and I'm really honored to, I would like to th thank EPOS to have the possibility to participate in, in this meeting, to this course. Mm -hmm. I get a quite difficult top, uh, topic to talk about the type 2A. Is it uh, like immaturity or is, is it uh, early onset of the hip dysplasia? So what means type 2A? Is it a physiologically immature hip joint or is it a true hip dysplasia? So what we know, so what was first already mentioned here, that type 2 hip joint is also a centered hip joint. The total roof, bony plus cartilage, is well covered the femoral head. The, proposition, the proportion between the bone, the bone and cartilage differ from the type 1, with the more cartilage and less bone which cover the femoral head. 
and the bony rim is also rounded in comparison to cartilage roof which appears in the type 1 hips. This is what we know from graph study which I mentioned below. Renata mentioned about the type of the bony roof so I would like not to repeat the same thing but usually this bony roof it's a little bit it's, it may be adequate or with some delayed ossification. The bony rim may be blunt or sometimes it may be scabbed, like rounded, but usually it's more blunt. But this is more typical for the type 2 hip joint. So when Graf was studying, when he was trying to establish his technique, he saw that some of type 2a hips go to the good direction of treatment and without to the good direction without any problems and mature itself but not all of them so he was trying to find what's going on what is the difference between in the group in the group of type 2a hip joint so he found that at the birth the minimum maturity of alpha angle should be 50 degrees then the hip joint is changing, is growing, and become the alpha angle becomes 60 degrees at the end of the third month. But some of these hips had some delayed maturation and didn't follow this linear maturity uh, level and differ from, from this one, from, from this type. So he called the normal maturation pattern is like type 2A plus hip and other hip joints which cannot follow this linear maturity as type 2a minus he presented it very well at the sonometer which probably all of you know very well so of course when the checklist one is validated and you pass through the checklist two and you analyze all, all this landmark then you can draw the line and here what you can see on on the sonometer that when you look at the type 2a hips that some of them have here the number from 55 degrees up to 60 degrees depends on the month. So this helps you to find where is the hip joint when you diagnose it at, for example, six weeks of age, seven, 10 weeks of age, etc. So when they follow this linear progress, you may be sure that you have type 2A plus hips. Let me show some examples, like here. This is the moment which I would love to have this Kahoot tool and make you voting. What do you, what will you do at different age? So let's put to the situation as the um, as the doctor diagnosing the, this hip. You may have this type 2A hip at two weeks old with the alpha angle 52 degrees, like you see here at um, at the left uh, slide. So then for you, you know that it's type 2 a hip, but you cannot tell if it's really a hip dysplasia or, or this is like an immature hip. What you know that you need to follow that. At seven weeks old, you already know that this you are passing to the threshold of the type 2 a plus or type 2 a minus. And with the knowledge which we already gave you, you know how to classify this hip. And also the same thing is coming at 11 weeks old that you know that this hip won't achieve 60 degrees of alpha angle in one week, like at three months. So these cases are rare, but I have found for you some examples, like for example, here, it's another kid with the type to a uh, hip joint, and also depends on the age, you, you should classify them. For sure, at two weeks old, you will wait and observe, but probably later, you will think what to do, what to do with this hip at with the alpha angle is 51 degrees at six weeks old, or especially better at 11 weeks old. There is another case finding our our outpatient clinic with this alpha angle type 2a, and we jump or in the same problem of the discussion, the decision what to do at seven weeks old. Do should we wait? Or should should we treat them? But this will be a part of the another talks during today's webinar. All these hip joints, which I show you here, like immature hips at the, with the type 2A, went well diagnosed and well followed, like it should be with the rule. So all the type 2A minus were treated, 
and gain maturity in the, a little bit later, but still without any other intervention. So like a take home message, type to A hip, maybe the early onset of the dysplasia, and of course request some follow-up, especially when they didn't follow the maturation, maturation pattern of the 55 angle at six weeks at 60 degrees of alpha angle at 12 weeks old. Unfortunately, it is not possible to differentiate between type 2A plus and type 2A minus hip joint before the six weeks of life. Thank you for your attention. Professor Westhoff, we can see your presentation. Oh, I don't see it. <laughs> uh, is it fine now? So, hello to yeah. everybody, also from my side. So, we also heard a, a bit about the two type 2A hip. And you know, the question is now to treat or not to treat. So, you all know this. In the craft classification system, you have the stable and the unstable hips. And in the type 2, it's something confusing because it's a bit of everything. But the 2A hip is a stable hip, which is defined with an alpha angle of 50 to 59 degrees in babies uh, at the age of younger than 12 weeks. And at the age of 6 weeks, we have to discriminate and distinguish the physiologically immature ones and the real pathological dysplastic ones. So the prevalence depends on the age of the population examined. And in most of the studies, it's between 10 and 15 percent. According to Gra, um, we do not have to treat the hips which are physiologically immature but we do have to treat the real pathological ones with an abduction brace. But this algorithm is not generally accepted. One point is that uh, a lot of hips will develop physiologically and become normal, and then treatment is over treatment. And the second thing is that the ultrasound technique itself is of questionable reliability. And indeed, in a systematic review, there's a poor to model inter-examination inter-rater reliability. And the sad thing is that in the last three decades, it even declined. So this should stimulate us to improve the examination quality with, by continuous education, attendance of instructional courses, and very strict application of the graph standards, like using a positional device, the checklist, and so on. So to treat or not to treat. So we have to know something about the natural history. And there we have the study of Hakan. They screened the babies at the age of three to four weeks. And then at that age, they found 13% type 2A hips. Three weeks later, almost 80% turned to type 1. But 12% required treatment because they were now pathologically dysplastic especially in girls. And interesting, only 14% of the treated babies had a risk factor for DDH. And there's another study. It's from the Netherlands, and they did the first ultrasound examination with one month, range two to seven weeks, then another one with two and three months. At the first ultrasound, 36% of the infants showed an immature hips, and 1.5% a 2A minus hip. If you now follow the uh, development of the physiologically immature hips, most of them, 95%, were normal at the age of three months. But with the type 2A minus hips, this was only 
In other words, 15 almost 15 percent were pathologic at the age of three months, and if we add the almost five percent of the primarily physiologically type two A plus, uh, which didn't develop nicely, so at the age of three months we have a pathologic dysplastic hip in almost 20 percent. In a literature review by Sappers, they found for the graft 2A hips, depending on the age of the examination and um, the follow up time, also a normalization rate of 80 to 95 degrees uh, percent. This means that 5 to 20 percent will not develop normally. And he also found a deterioration rate of 5 percent. They concluded that graph to a hips can safely be followed for a longer time, but they didn't distinguish between the physiological and the pathological hips. So there is a significant amount of primarily immature physiological hips that turn to a pathologic hip. There are some clinical uh, risk factors discussed, and also an angle gamma. The angle gamma is uh, the angle between the baseline and the line from the uh, bo uh, border of the ileum to the medial cone of the labrum. And the cutoff value is 78 degrees. Hips with an angle, gamma angle of less than 77 degrees will not develop to a normal hip, but a dysplastic one. So will adduction treatment help? There's one study by Wood, and he did a, um, a study on hips aged two to six weeks, and they either got a public harness or just observation, and they included stable hips during the bowel maneuver during ultrasound examination, and hips had a femoral head coverage of less than 40%. At the age of four months and uh, two years follow-up, they didn't find any significant difference in the acetabular index. So no benefit from early splintage for stable but dysplastic hips. But again, they didn't classify according to graph. So we do not have any knowledge about the pathologic morphology of the acetabular roof. In another study by Kim, the children were a little bit older, also stable hips with an alpha angle of 40 to 55 degrees and the femoral head coverage of less than 50%. Whether the hips were treated or not depended on the opinion of the pediatric orthopedic surgeon. And after two years, the, they couldn't find any significant difference between the acetabular index in these two groups. So, they concluded milder, stable sonographic hip dysplasia can be observed. But this study has several um, limitations. First of all, they didn't use a positioning device for the ultrasound examination, which is mandatory to get a reliable outcome. Then the study cohort was quite inhomogeneous. So we had alpha angles of 40 degrees, so meaning highly dysplastic, unstable hips. And we had the ones with an alpha angle of 55 degrees, um, which is rather a mild dysplasia. And when analyzing the treatment results, they didn't consider the pathoanatomical situation of the hip. And by the way, they had a quite high top out rate. So in the Netherlands, based on the currently available literature, they developed a treatment algorithm. And for the type 2 A hips, they don't recommend treatment, but only ultrasound follow-up examinations. Again, no distinction between physiological and pathological hips. And this concept does not consider the histopathological damage to the chondroosseous junction of the acetabular roof that might occur uh, when they occur 
shear forces. And so early treatment would be much better in this in this sense. So treatment, over treatment. Actually, the evidence is not very well. And there's no study evaluating especially the natural history of type 2A minus versus, versus treatment. And the ana analysis of the natural history shows that 81 to 88 percent will develop normally. And indeed, this means over treatment. But on the other side, the remodeling potential is the highest within the first two or three months, as we know from the maturation curve. And delay of treatment means negative consequences for 12 to 19 percent of the infants with a longer treatment time, an impact on the motor development, and probably a damage to the chondroosseous junction. So why not treat just in case that you are on the safe side, have a short treatment time, an average four to eight weeks, the child is ready in time for start of locomotion, and we do not have a significant complication of it. And I think the treatment costs and probably psychosocial problems for the caregivers are a minor problem. So should we treat the 2A hips? The physiologically immature hips only need ultrasound control. There's slow evidence about the natural history for type 2A minus hips, and treating all the type minus hips means being on the safe side. And it's clear that we need further high quality studies based on graph classification system. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to talk about the results uh, of the nationwide newborn hip screening program in Turkey. Now, a short history uh, of the program I would like to give to you. Uh, the incidence of DDH was estimated to be around uh, 1 per 100 live births in 90s in Turkey. The prevalence of dislocation uh, subluxation in childhood was found to be around 6 per 1,000. And it was reported that uh, about one third of the total re replacements was due to DDH in Turkey. Everything changed when a couple of Turkish surgeons visited Professor Gravin Tolza to learn hip ultrasonography in 1996. And he's saying, my residents do not like me because they see only a couple of DDH operations after nationwide hip screening program has been initiated really impressed us. So it was... Uh, time for us to do something in our country where DDH had been a serious health problem as the number of new DDH cases uh, was around 13 to 15,000 per year and we were performing many osteotomies in neglected or missed cases over the age of two and three years. Therefore, local institutional newborn hip screening programs were immediately initiated in several parts of the country. So nationwide hip ultrasonography uh, and DDH courses were organized. Professor Graf visited Turkey several times to personally teach the Graf method. Local training programs for family physicians and general practitioners about the importance of DDH was organized. And the preliminary results of our institutional uh, universal screening program encouraged us uh, because the rate of pelvic osteotomy was zero among the babies who were immediately treated 
uh, after general uh, ultrasonography tip screening within the first weeks of life. So we had to determine the type of hip screening as the number of leave births was around 1.2 million uh, per year and we had limited number of trained staff in hip ultrasonography. However, we had to uh, initiate the newborn hip screening as soon as possible and we initially de decided to start with the selective program and then to convert it into universal one. The executive committee of the National Society completed the project and this is the photo taken just before the presentation of the project to the Ministry of Health. Training of the trainers from all cities was performed in 2010 and these trainers uh, trained the health staff related to the nationwide hip screening program in all parts of the country between 2011 and 2013. Finally, the official circular was published in July 13, uh, 2013. The main program partners are the Ministry of Health and Turkish Society of Children's Orthopedics, and the examination and treatment costs of newborns are covered by the social security system. And the results obtained from the data of the social security system between the years 2015 and 2020 after the initiation of the nationwide hip screening. Uh, in 2020, 94% of the newborns in the country was uh, being screened, while it was about 50% in the beginning. And nowadays, it is almost 100% of the babies are being screened. You see the rate of screened newborns did even not decrease in the pandemic. So we now have and a universal hip screening that has developed simultaneously and spontaneously. This spontaneous transition is due to the increased awareness of both parents and health professionals and increased number of training activities of, of health professionals. And perhaps the most important uh, graphic, the rate of primary surgery significantly changed. There was a 50% increase in the rate of closed open reduction, whereas 60% decrease in the rate of osteotomy. We do not have a detailed uh, nationwide data uh, about the change in the rate of abduction bracing, but it is all our observations that the rate of abduction bracing has significantly increased. We are now conducting a multicentric nationwide study comparing the rates of operations before and after the year 2013. And this is a recent published study coming from Haran University, that's a reference center in the Southeast region where the incidence of DDH is very high. The rate of newborn hip screening rise from three and a half percent to 93%. And while the pelvic osteotomies constitute 77% of the all DDH operations in 2012, this rate was found to be 48% in 2019. And also the rate of close reduction rise from 20% to uh, 46% and the rate of open reduction rise from 3% uh, to 6%. Also the rate of uh, failed public treatment uh, in the close reduction group significantly increased and this showed the increased rate of abduction bracing in earlier ages. So in conclusion, the success of the nationwide newborn hip screening program is primarily due to the close collaboration between the Ministry of Health and the National Society of Children's Orthopedics. Also the support of orthopedic surgeons, participation of other related specialties as well as the increased awareness of the parents are the essential factors. So according to the nine years of experience, we can say that although we have a considerable high number of uh, live newborns per year, the number of screened babies increased year by year, and we now have an universal uh, hip screening program that includes the screening of almost all live newborns. Year by year, the rate of abduction bracing increased, the number of minor operations increased, and the number of invasive operations significantly decreased. 
And uh, I'm proud to say that many orthopedic residents can uh, only see a couple of major DDA operations in children. So let's start, let's finish my talk with a famous saying of Professor Graf, let the others perform hip surgery, do ultrasonographic screening. Thank you. So I will end this uh, presentations with the uh, recommendation, what is the best, a clinical, a selective, or a general ultrasound screening program? Um, we all agree that the goals of all DDH screening strategies should be to early detect a baby with DDH in order to start with an early appropriate treatment, uh, to reduce the rate of late DDH, whatever the definition of late DDH uh, may be, and therefore to reduce the surgical interventions related to DDH, which are significantly uh, correlated to a bad prognosis of a baby hip with DDH. What are the problems of literature regarding screening pro programs? Literature is difficult to interpret because of different methods which are used and often combined in the papers. Most of the studies are substantially underpowered to detect significant differences and maybe more than 100,000 infants are likely to be enrolled, are needed to be enrolled to report significant differences. The definition of late DDH is inconsistent. Is this a neglected hip older than 12 weeks, older than six months? This uh, definition is inconsistently used due, uh, throughout literature and the screening strategies highly depend on the healthcare system and the politics in the different countries. Opponents of general ultrasound screening programs hold that a general screening program always leads to overdiagnosis and overtreatment, does not influence the rate of late DDH compared to selective or clinical screening programs, and does not reduce the rate of surgical interventions. And as you may know, Austria has a general ultrasound screening program since Professor Graf uh, was from, uh, is from Austria. And um, the ultrasound screening program as a national surveillance program was introduced in Austria in 1992 with the ultrasound technique according to Graf. Uh, we have a so-called mother-child passport, which is directly linked to uh, money uh, mothers get from the country if they bring their child within the first week and in the sixth and eighth week after birth uh, to hip sonography. Those two screening time points were related according to the maturation curve we all, we've already seen. Uh, in order to evaluate our ultrasound screening program, we did a statistical analysis of all infant hip data concerning DDH in Austria from 1992 to 2008. And we tried to answer uh, the following questions. Does the general hip ultrasound screening program, as we use it in Austria, lead to overdiagnosis and overtreatment? And with our analysis, we found out that the rate of conservative treatment in Austria decreased since the 80s, when in Austria, pediatricians and orthopedic surgeons started to use hip sonography and significantly decreased from the year the ultrasound screening program started in Austria and still is decreasing. The second question was, could the number of first hospital admissions be reduced? And we found out that, that from the early 90s to 2008, there was a reduction of 62% of inpatient first admissions per 1,000 live births because of DDH to the hospital. The third question to answer was, could the number of first surgical procedures be reduced? And we tried to differentiate between open reductions and more invasive pelvic osteotomies, which we perform after walking age. And we found out that there was a significant reduction of 30% between 1992 and 2008. 
the open reduction rate in 2008 was very low with 0.16 per 1,000 below four years, but immigrants from unscreened countries were included in these uh, statistics. Uh, further or more recent studies from Austria showed that the open reduction rate is still decreasing and uh, with this uh, paper we proved that at the moment we have an open reduction rate of almost zero with a rate of 0.07% and the treatment rate of 1% in Austria. The Austrian results are supported by national studies from Germany where an open reduction rate of 0.26 per 1000 was published and from UK with a paper uh, comparing three different clinical or three different screening groups, one with the clinical, one with the selective screening program and one with the general screening program. And more than 30,000 babies included in the group with the general screening program showed an open reduction rate of 0.06 per 1,000 live births. So where are we going? Which should we recommend? The clinical, selective or general hip ultrasound screening program? Uh, we all agree that a dislocated or an unstable hip at birth can be diagnosed easily by clinical examination. But hip abnormalities without instability can only be detected by imaging techniques such as hip sonography. And we found a strong correlation between uh, unstable sonographic, unstable hips and the rate of clinical stability. And if you look at the 2C unstable hips according to graph, the rate of clinical stable hips would be 75%. So you would miss 25% of unstable hips with clinical examination only. What are the problems of selective screening programs? That there is no consensus about the amounts of risk factors which should be taken into consideration when performing a selective screening strategy or program in a country. The only agreed risk factors which are more or less um, evidence are a positive family history, bridge position and clinical instability. But if you only take these three risk factors into consideration while doing a selective screening program, you would only screen 12 to 16 percent of all newborns because only those would be defined at, as at risk. But if you look through literature of all those reported outcomes of selective screening programs, more than 15 percent of the population was screened by ultrasound. So different selective screening programs take different amounts of risk factors into consideration and if you take all those risk, risk factors and, 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 and screen a baby with the risk factors, maybe you will have an almost general hip ultrasound screening program in your country. So how to choose now? What should we choose? Which factor is the one to prove to be the, pe the best? So if we all agree that severe DDH is late diagnosed and needs open reduction and that the surgery influences prognosis badly, then the rate of open reduction per 1,000 births per year for each country with the, with the selective or uh, general hip ultrasound screening program is a reliable outcome measurement to compare different strategies. And literature therefore gives us a clear answer with decreasing incidences of open reduction rates in general screening program countries. So as a take home message, general ultrasound screening programs do not lead to overdiagnosis and overtreatment with at the moment reported treatment rates of less than 1% compared to rates of selectively screened study populations of 2%. It does reduce the rates of late DDH and open reduction to an almost zero level with incidences of 0.07 in Austria to 0.16 per 1,000 live births. So in conclusion, in my opinion, any other than general ultrasound screening program is a compromise. Thank you. Okay, it's time 
for discussion and can we ask all the panelists to open their webcams and microphones? Okay, we have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, Triple nappy therapy and repeat scan at 12 weeks. Anybody wants to comment on it? Probably okay. uh, for normal hips or scanning, it, 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 the question is not so clear. It, Maurizio, would you like to comment? Yeah, we performed a study about a double diapering, and there's clearly uh, the the answer there is no effectiveness of putting some uh, diapers on a baby. Uh, the mm, diapers mm, do not influence the position of the hip, uh, particularly the abduction and deflection. I don't have uh, results about triple diaper. Uh, any other comments, Bettina, Bilages, Renata? So yeah, about, I, okay, go, go, Renata. I agree, the nappy therapy is not evidence-based and it's not an option not to look into the baby hip and to do dip, double or triple nappy therapy. And it gives the parents a false confidence as yeah, well. Yeah, an alibi. Okay. Exactly, and to, to keep the hip in the, um, the good position, we need at least 90 degrees of flexion and 60 degrees of abduction. I'm not aware about any standard diaper to keep this position, so no, no, and no. I totally agree with that. Well, it's uh, nice, uh, it might in type 2A plus hips, which need a control that the parents uh, are reminded there is something which has to be controlled. It's not very, very normal. So it reminds them that they have to go to a control examination and therefore it might help. Mm -hmm. We have a, another question that can be answered by any of the panelists. Uh, can Maybe I can make a comment on this question, Hakan. So the question was, can one of the speakers please comment on what the role of femoral head coverage percentage in conjunction with alpha angle graph scans is? So if you've learned the technique accurately, then you will know that the alpha angle does not represent the femoral head coverage. So it's all about the hyaline and the cartilaginous acetabular structures in the baby hip, what Graf tried to teach us. So you can only try to define femoral head coverage with the description. If you look on the bony roof and see if it's good or deficient, then you may say good if it's more than 50% covering, deficient if it's 50-50 and poor if it's less than 50%. But the alpha angle does not correlate with the femoral head coverage. And uh, it is certain that uh, graph technique, graph method does not include any description like femoral head coverage. Yeah, true. Maurizio. Yeah, another point is that femoral head coverage depends on the position of the baby and of the femur. Instead, alpha angle doesn't. Yeah. So, Hakan, there's a question to you. Are there good and accurate models available for practicing infant ultrasound technique? I'm going to talk about the graph technique. The only and the best way to be trained about the graph method is the the uh, in, uh, courses uh, that is given by the certified trainers. There is no models or anything else. And in our country, we make this by training the trainers, then they perform ultrasonographic courses, hands-on ultrasonographic courses. There is no way, no other way to train 
the practitioners about the graph method. Yeah. It is not a bedside training. It should be trained in ultrasonography courses. Mm -hmm. Bettina, I have a question to you. Uh, you did a lot of literature review on the recent literature regarding selective uh, screening programs and, and abnormalities in the infant baby hip and that a lot of uh, unstable hips can be only followed by wait and see tactic. Uh, did you find anything regarding risk factors in those papers with uh, uh, proposing selective screening programs? Well, you already mentioned it's mainly breech position, family history, and um, positive family history. And for the development of the 2A hips, well, the, there are some papers mentioning some risk factors, but others, for example, sex and breech position, but others didn't find that, couldn't correlate that with the positive development of the 2A hips. And so actually, um, I, th I thought it was very interesting, the alpha angle, uh, the, the gamma angle, sorry, <laughs> the gamma angle, but I never saw another publication uh, re-evaluating this factor, but I thought it was very interesting. Yeah, the most interesting but point- Everybody of you use the gamma angle? No. But the most interesting point was that Countries with uh, selective screening programs have an, an, a big amount of risk factors they take into consideration to screen a baby. So if you do that, you almost have a general screening program because then you have a, a high percentage of screen population. Yeah. Mauricio, uh, we have a question to you. At what age the screening is done? You already mentioned it, but uh, in your daily practice, at what age you you make the screening and who does the ultrasonographic examination? The uh, ultrasound screening should be performed um, performed before the stage of the babies from the neonatology. There's the sure um, um, strategy for have a lot of um, the, the high percentage of uh, screen baby. Another um, strategy is to um, say if we have some um, problems with the with the colleagues, with the um, examiners, to uh, suggest uh, until the six weeks of life, but not later. In Italy, there is no consensus about a universal screening. No consensus. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, I see my position a lot of late diagnosis because uh, so this is my fight against the late diagnosis. The key is the early diagnosis of the DH, not not ultrasound or clinical examination. The early diagnosis is the key point. And I'm sorry, you can do that only performing ultrasound. Now, I don't know, in 10 years, in 20 years, what happened, but now I think this is the, the answer. I have a question to Blasi. There's a question. Do you recommend any type of exercise or physiotherapy after conservative treatment of DDH? So we know that the limit of an um, um, abduction is a risk factor. So maybe recommendation of uh, physical treatment uh, is not the best idea, but to improve the, uh, the abduction, yes, we should have a good abduction and especially to allow kids to move normally, not to uh, restrict hip motion at this time. So I, I would say the hip motion is the most important. Okay. Renata, there is a question to you. Why up to date yet doesn't recommend the universal ultrasonographic screening? It's a pity. 
<laughs> this is really bad. Yeah, we have. Uh, uh, there was a question today by email uh, coming up uh, over our EPO secretary. Uh, there is a new paper with the meta-analysis from Finland published uh, this month in August, uh, showing that there is no difference, no significant difference between selectively screened population and generally screened population. But if you look through the literature which was taken for the meta-analysis, there are a lot of bias which maybe you only can define if you really know by heart what is all around the hip sonography. The first thing is that, again, selectively screened population take a lot of risk factors into consideration which are not evidence-based. So at the end, every baby was screened. So we compare general screening population with general screened population, but they tell call it selectively screened. And the next thing is that there is there are lots of papers which were published in the early 90s when the screening technique started and when the countries had their learning curve and the pitfalls and the errors. And for those who published in the early 90s with a selectively screened population, they had an almost zero treatment rate because uh, they didn't maybe didn't know how to use this technique uh, uh, correctly. So I think in my opinion, we should only take recent papers into consideration uh, who have a long learning curve with this technique and definite clear risk factors for selectively screened population. So, Hakan, I don't know, what's your opinion about that? <laughs> I, uh, I have no other opinion other than yours. <laughs> Completely agree with you. <laughs> I would like to mention also that we have something which we call sudden dysplasia, which is about six to eight percent. So mm -hmm. even uh, with good clinical examination, we can miss this 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 probably these kids, which will will be the pity with the knowledge which we have now. Yeah. So there was a question: When is the next uh, graphs instructional course in Europe? So I think this needs needs to be an English course, not an Austrian German course or a Turkish course. So, anyone of you planning an English instructional course? I think we have to offer this to, to our educational committee. Yeah, great. Yeah, we should then. Yeah. So, I think there, there are two more questions about treatment. Uh, Post public harness treatment, would you win out or just stop the treatment? Bettina, how do you do it in Germany? Usually, uh, well, I treat until an alpha angle of 65 degrees. And then, usually, if I'm very happy and convinced that the result is fine, then um, I well, stop immediately, no weaning. Sometimes in cases when the, um, the bony rim is a little bit roundy, a little bit, hmm, then I say them, to them, just wear the brace during night, night time. Okay. And, and uh, which uh, harness or abduction splint would you recommend for countries who do not have public harness available? Actually, I never used the public harness. Okay. Um, <laughs> I always use the tubingen splint, which is, which is very easily to handle and parents are very happy with it and yes, can cope with it very good, very nicely. And it's well accepted. There is a comment from the audience. In reality, does femoral health coverage more than 50% correlate with better prognosis for achieving hip maturity again the uh, again this finding any one of you would like to comment uh, first of all i would like to say that the reliability of the femoral head coverage it has an kappa value um, interclass correlation co coefficient of 0 0.0.2. 
in the meta-analysis. So it tells us this is not a good, reliable uh, parameter. And actually, I do not know whether it's correlating with the alpha angle because I never use it. I'm only using the graph method and I never use the femoral head coverage index. Mm -hmm. There, I can, there are um, some paper which compare the different techniques, Theresian and Morin and Suzuki and uh, the French one. And the conclusion was the best uh, parameter for, for the, the age evaluation is the alpha angle, definitively. Mm -hmm. There is an, another interesting question. Uh, when do panel members agree to stop ultrasound screening and switch over to radiographs? So what is your uppermost age limit for ultrasound in your daily practice? To all panel members, yes. Twelve so, months. Yeah. Twelve months, Maurice. Yes. Yes. So to answer this accurately, I I will agree with Maurizio. It's around twelve months. But to answer it accurately, according to Raf, uh, from the point the ossific nucleus is covering the lower limb of the bony roof, you're not able to measure the alpha angle and then you're not able to do measurements. This might be in a seven months old with a big ossific nucleus or uh, in a 12 months old, but it's around one year, yeah. And this does not mean that you, 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 you have to perform at six months, for example, at the end of treatment, X-ray of the pelvis, but if you have done to the, the if you can see the nuclei, you can still uh, look at the nuclei uh, appearance later by ultrasound, not by X-ray. Mm -hmm. In normal wow. developed why, hips after treatment. Why do, you, why do you have to do perform an X-ray at the end of treatment? I never do it. We do the first. It's a legal problem. problem. It's only a legal problem. But the ultrasound gives you a much better, a much better picture of the hip. Yeah, because I agree with you. The cartilage. But if you don't have a documentation of the old method like X-ray of the pelvis, and you have some problem, there is another problem. So we used to perform an X-ray at the end of treatment, always. But we can discuss in the future about this strategy. Actually, I think I can. Our, at least in our hospital, um, the X rays are very often of a very low quality because they are not symmetric, and actually, you wouldn't be allowed to um, analyze them. Is it better in your hospital? Or what is your experience with that? No. I don't think, I think almost 30% of the x-ray of the pelvis over the world are not good x-ray and the technique, there is some, um, some errors in the, in the position of the babies. That's also true. And Bettina, do you do follow-ups after walking age of type 3 and 4 uh, oh, treatments with x-ray? No follow-up for any children um, who had uh, treatment. So we performed the first x-ray uh, at the age of 18 to 20 months and then do a second one at the age of about 3 to 4 years. And we follow them up to the age um, of skeletal maturity. Mm -hmm. I do the follow-up, uh, the x-ray after the treatment at uh, two years old. According to tennis, we should have a cellular index 24 degrees and 24 months. So I think that is the best like rule to, to see how is the cellular development. So I usual I usually wait till two years of age for the x-ray. Baja, there's maybe a question for you because you talked about immature hips or early onset. There was a question if there's a premature baby, 
born in the 32nd week and there are risk factors. Do you do the ultrasound directly or do you wait until the calculated date of birth? And when would you start with treatment? So this question is a little bit difficult to answer, but based on my experience, I'm doing the I'm orthopedic consultant in the newborn department and every kid at risk born before the 36 weeks of age is I, I'm called to make an ultrasound. And based on that, except some really exceptional teratogenic, teratogenic dislocation of the hip joint. I never saw any really dysplastic, severely dysplastic hip joint in 32 weeks. So with the cl normal clinical examination, I may say that we can wait a little bit but uh, and do the um, ultrasound only in bad clinical examination, limited abduction or um, ap apparent shortening of the lower extremity or something like this. Mm -hmm. Renata, there is a question, but the answer is certain. Are the baby cradle and ultrasonography probe tower necessary for proper hip ultrasonography by the graft method? Of course, if you would like to minimize tilting errors, you should use that. The so-called freehand ultrasound is not good. And there are some papers about that. And um, I think we should also look at the quality of the images, of the published images, uh, because we are talking about results of sometimes from paper with no qualities or images. I agree. When, when we look at the literature concerning the late diagnosed cases, uh, in some papers I can see some insufficient images uh, about the graph ultrasonography. The, these hips are not late diagnosed hips, these are initially missed cases. Even in the very well-known uh, journals, we can see such images. And you know, when you do tilting error, it's really easy to make from some 2C hip a type 2A hip, just because of the tilting problem. So mm -hmm. this all this holding device, it's really helpful and it make, um, it keeps our kids safe, our patients safe. Okay, we have another interesting and long question. If current hip ultrasound techniques all have low and declining reliability despite intense educational efforts, should other ultrasound systems not be pursued rather than increasing the teaching of these systems? For example, 3D ultrasonography and so on. So may I answer a little bit this question? Because I have, I have, I was lucky to work with Professor Harkey in the United States uh, and make some study, and it was published also. And I was lucky to work with Ali Puat Karatas, which is one of her Turkish friends, about the 3D hip ultrasound. And unfortunately, due to the morphology of the hip joint and very low liquid, it's so difficult to make a reliable hip uh, ultrasound in the 3D um, view. So I think that we maybe we need a better understanding of the hip motion and then some of the dynamic screening techniques may be helpful but it's only a help from other technique but because graph prove it that there is the best way for screening very repeatable and reliable technique so I think that others may be helpful for understanding, not for screening or treatment. I don't think that graph technique is not reliable. If you follow the strict rules of the graph technique, it is highly reliable and repeatable. Yes, of course, it's what I, what I, what I was trying to say. But it's the problem that a lot of people do not uh, use the checklist and everything like that and it's a problem with the quality. Of course, completely agree. It's what Renata mentioned, it's just the proper uh, line drawing, checklist one, checklist two, we need to be very strict on that. 
of course with time we get a little bit more of experience in that but we never should uh, forget about being in the proper position without any tilting and draw the line accurate way you have to be very strict like the pilot's checklist in germany we do have a quality management control system so uh, colleagues who do not fulfill the criteria for the quality, they lose their license or do have to do another uh, course or anything like that. So that really improves the quality and reliability. So yeah, quite happy with that. Yeah. But it's not perfect yet. <laughs> Otherwise, the social security system is not covering the, the course. Oh, they lose the license for uh, the ultrasound examination. Okay. Hakan, there's a question about predicting growth. Is an attempt to predict growth of a hip an example of inductive logic and not scientific? Is it not better to observe periodically to maturity? So I'm not really sure if I understood the question, but if yeah, this was about type two apes, yeah, yeah, if this was about type two apes, then uh, yeah, maybe it's inductive logic and not totally scientific. But at the end, uh, we have this maturation curve which is having a plateau early. And then if we find out that at the time of plateau, the hip is not mature, the hip is unstable, becoming unstable or is dysplastic, we uh, have lost a lot of time. So this is emotionally bad for the parents and still is also not scientific because we don't know what the natural history of a TDH hip is. So we always need to be faster with all the knowledge we have nowadays. Exactly. Uh, how, how do you, do you yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. How, how do, do you, you predict the <laughs> that are under treatment? Yeah. Especially these unstable ones. Do you removing the, your braces or not while performing ultrasound to all panelists? I remove it. Me, Me too. too. So when? I start with the with the Harky technique when the public harness is put on and then I remove it and check with the graph technique to have a better measurement and something which I can repeat the measurement. Mm -hmm. A double technique. Does you anyone have... use the rhino abduction brace? Which one? Is, is this the, the, the Rosen splint? The rhino abduction brace? So I just need to Google it because I didn't know what the rhino abduction brace is. And this is this thermoplastic splint. I think it's like the Rosen splint. You, you make it hot and then you can, it, uh, can adopt it to the baby, but I have no experience. No, me too. Okay. No idea. So maybe as the Scandinavian people, they have a lot of experience with the Rosen splint. Maybe they can next EPOS webinar talk about the rhino brace. What percentage of adult total hip replacements are due to hip dysplasia? In my country, it is one third. <laughs> uh, In Italy, we have a register, well, all country, we have a register of uh, the DH uh, uh, prosthesis, and uh, it changed between 30% and 10% in the years. Yeah all patients but the problem is that the ddh osteoarthritis are in younger patient 40 45 and so they have a long follow-up and not so sure and safe um, follow-up because of the young age I think that we cannot enter to this discussion what is the femoral cellular index. Is it due to the hip dysplasia or something other risk factor? 
but also the problems on the reporting. How do they report? I saw in my country many people uh, reporting a type 2A hips like a hip dysplasia and uh, coding like uh, ICD-10, Q65, which may really uh, interfere with the, um, with the later statistics. Some osteotomy questions we have, but it is uh, out of the scope of this webinar. So a lot of questions, Hakan. A lot of questions. I'm trying to follow. How long does it take you takes you to make one exam one hip? It's a technical question. It depends on your experience. And on the behavior of the baby. <laughs> so if everything runs well and the baby is, is calm it's 10 seconds yes i agree yes i agree but it is all, always necessary to have at least two images yeah correct True. images yeah at least so it may extend up to 20 seconds in order to have another uh, image it's not finished computer screen to me yeah in some countries pediatric clinics do not have ultrasonography specialists and for some reasons they can't afford it have to screen the babies at these clinics mm -hmm. it's about a question uh, if we do not have an ultrasound what should we do to screen the babies Better I think the ultrasound machine we can find in every department, in surgery department, in radiology or somewhere, some, somewhere else. So it's just the question of organization. If we are in the hospital or big outpatient clinic, the problem is in some places when there is no medical services. So how to bring people to the um, clinic where, where we have ultrasound? This is the question of the organization of, of the healthcare. And the, in these places, I think the maturity department, when we can do the ultrasound at the discharge of the newborn, it's a good idea to do the screening. The problem is more having um, trained examiners than ultrasound machine. You can buy an ultrasound machine today for 3,000 euro or less with the acceptable quality of the transducer. Yes, exactly. Trained stuff. Yes. So for training stuff, you go for the course. Yeah. yeah. And the last, I think, the question, what is the uppermost age limit for public harness usage in your hands? The problem is the diagnosis of type 4 hips. There is a paper that say not uh, uh, not good the public harness in type 4 hips. Is a, or you publish about that, Hakan? I don't know. Yes, yes. 2013, uh, some. Uh, the public harness uh, does not work, especially over the age of four months and in graph four hips, in my experience. In late diagnosis, I'm sure it doesn't work. Okay, Renata, I think it's time to close. Should we, should we close the webinar? We have some questions, but we will not be able to answer every question. Um, because it's half past seven and we're overdue. Um, thank you, Hakan, Blaget, Bettina and Maurizio for your contribution to this DDH screening webinar. Thank you to more than 600 registrants for this EPOS mm -hmm. webinar, which is really huge uh, record, as I heard. Um, I would like to mention to you colleagues the upcoming EPOS advanced course on pediatric hand and upper extremity surgery in November in Speising. Please do not miss to register 
the last course in 2019 was uh, hugely successful and there will be a big faculty so check for further information uh, for the EPOS advanced courses on the web page and with these words I would like to say you stay healthy all the best and see you at the next annual meeting in Krakow in Poland goodbye thank you bye bye yeah bye